legend has it back in 1670 that the choir master at a cathedral in Germany handed out sugar sticks to his young singers to keep them quiet during the church ceremony. And in honor of the occasion, he had the candies bent to look like shepherd's crooks. So that's how candy canes supposedly started. Candy can be as much of a holiday tradition as decorating the tree, putting up lights, and exchanging gifts. However, some holiday candy, such as fudge, peanut brittle, toffee, and peanut butter balls, are a lot more difficult to make than people realize. In fact, you might say it's a science. On today's Sound Living, tips for making homemade candy. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman. When it comes to making candy, K-State Research and Extension food scientist and coordinator of the university's Rapid Response Center, Karen Blakesley, says it's a cooking process that usually turns into a food science experiment. Candy is basically divided into two categories. It's called crystalline candies or non-crystalline candies. A crystalline type candy is one that is like a fudge. You have to be careful when making fudge because sometimes you get little crystals that form inside and that gives that grainy feeling Mm -hmm. in your mouth. So that's why we call it a crystalline candy. And the goal is to limit the amount of crystals that form when you're making fudge. Now, a non-crystalline candy is something like a peanut brittle or a toffee. In fudge, they are going to form, but the goal is to keep them as small as possible so you don't feel them. But in non-crystalline candies, you don't want those to form at all. And that's what a brittle or a toffee, that's in that category. Is that almost like an air pocket? It's a sugar crystal that's forming. When you're cooking a sugar solution, you're evaporating water and the sugar concentrates. But during that cooking process, if water gets in there, crystals can form. It's a balance between controlling the heat, how long you cook it, the temperature it gets to, and watching any kind of excess moisture. Even humidity in the air can be absorbed into a candy. So that can really mess things up too. So it really is a science experiment every time you make it. This is something that people are going to learn by trial and error. The more you do it, the better off you are at it. That's right. For example, I'm making fudge. Fudge is basically chocolate, corn syrup, butter, and sugar and maybe some vanilla or something like that. And it's really important to use butter. Butter is one of those things you just don't want to substitute or use any margarine or anything like that. Butter is the thing because there's cream in there, you got that milk fat in there, and that can help prevent crystals from forming when making fudge. You have added water when you have margarine or something like that, there's excess water. That's right. Margarine, depending on the percentage of fat that's in there, it can have excess water. So don't substitute. This is one of those things you just want to use the it's real thing. It's not healthy thing. to begin with. Well, so it's you... not. But, you know, when you're eating candy, it's you want to have small amounts and just don't overindulge in it and enjoy the treat. You know, that's this time of year. Use butter. Corn syrup is usually in fudge because that also helps prevent crystals from forming. Those two things are important. The other thing is during the cooking process, sometimes you'll see the sides of the pan build up with some of the sugar mixture. You can clean the sides of the pan and keep that from really getting a thick formation on the sides. The simplest way is to put a lid on top of the pan, leave it there for about a minute, and the steam will trap inside the pan, and that'll dissolve those crystals on the sides and put them back in. Or you can take a brush with some water on it, with some warm water, and brush the sides of the pan, and that'll take care of that. Use a candy thermometer in any candy making because you can't guess what the temperature is going to be. And that's really important because there's so many stages of sugar formation and the evaporation of water. And whatever temperature it is, whether it's soft crack, hard crack, soft ball stage, hard ball stage, all of those will affect the texture of your candy in the end. So fudge is typically cooked to a softball stage, which is usually around 236 to 240 degrees. Candy thermometers, if you get the ones with the little plastic glass tube on them, they have those marked on there. So it makes it real easy to get the right temperature. So use a thermometer. In fudge, after reaching the softball stage, 
let the fudge sit. Don't stir it. Don't move it. Just leave it alone because you want the temperature to drop to 110 degrees. That's a real critical temperature because if you start stirring it too hot above that 110 degrees range, you'll end up with grainy fudge. But if you let it go below 110, it will set up and seize on you and get real stiff and you can't even stir it at all. And then you have to beat it. Beat it really, really fast and that'll prevent those large crystals from forming. You'll get a nice smooth fudge and then just put it in your pan, let it cool, and you're ready to eat. Now, what if you're trying to add some other ingredients into it? You want to add some nuts, mm-hmm. maybe even some marshmallows or something? Right. You want to add those at the end in the stirring stage. On the nuts, you could even warm those a little bit, put them in a pan on top of the stove or in the oven, toast them a little bit. That'll add a little more flavor because that won't change the temperature of your fudge too much. This is something that can be left out it can on the be. counter? It can be, Yeah. There's so much sugar in candy in general that sugar suppresses the growth of any bacteria or anything like that. So it's really never a problem with fudge. We never see any issues with food safety when it comes to making candy. Fudge may be the hardest or peanut brittle? Peanut brittle can be a challenge. Again, temperature is real important. And for this type of candy, you want to get it up to what's called the hard crack stage, which is around 300 to 310 degrees. And that gives it that caramely color, that nice pretty brown color and flavor. You're evaporating more water and that's how the temperature raises so high. Moisture is the key factor in making brittles and in toffee. If it's humid, I know this time of year it's not normally humid, but humidity can play a big factor in it. The other thing is to get it to that proper temperature. Really those are the two main things You'll also see baking soda added to peanut brittle, and when you add that, it foams up. It lowers the acidity in the brittle, but also what it does is it makes it easier to chew. It makes it a little more brittle, more porous. It's easier to break, and hopefully you won't crack your teeth with adding a little bit of soda. Otherwise, it's almost a toffee then if it's it's completely solid. Yes, And again, um, you're adding nuts to it. Use the warming trick again, like with the fudge. Warm the nuts up a little bit first before you add them to the brittle. When you pour it out on the pan, you want it to spread because you got to spread it out. So warm the nuts up first, and that'll help keep it from getting too cold. Now, maybe I missed it, but the, the syrup itself is basically sugar and water? Yeah, basically sugar and water. It might have a little vanilla in it, but that's basically it, sugar and water. I guess the key here then is also how thick you like it because I know I've seen a lot of thin brittle where the peanuts stand out prominently. I've seen others where the peanuts are buried in there. That's right. And that's all in pouring the the mixture out onto the pan and then spreading it out, how thin you want to spread it out. You can take a fork and just kind of pull it and you got to be quick about it because it will set up pretty fast. If you get really thick peanut brittle, I would make sure that soda's in there because it could be a little hard to chew really thick peanut brittle. One thing I can remember about my grandma is after she had made it and it had sat up, she would just take the pan, lift it about six inches, and just boom. That's right. And that was pretty much the pieces we ended up with. That's right. You know, that's that's what makes peanut brittle fun is the end because then you can just crack it into all kinds of different shapes, big, little, or whatever, so everybody can get the size that they like. Now, what about toffee? What's Mm -hmm. the difference between that and a brittle? Toffee is usually cooked a little bit longer, plus usually toffee has chocolate on top of it, too. I've had several people ask me, why does toffee separate? Sometimes they have problems during the cooking process. The butter separates out of the sugar mixture. So this can be pretty frustrating. Peanut brittles and toffee, they all have butter in them, and they all have sugar and water. Temperature change can cause that separation if it's an abrupt temperature change, the amount of stirring that you do can cause the separation to occur. If it's not stirred enough or if it's stirred constantly, it's it's a balance again. So it's practice makes perfect when making these things. Type of pan that you use in making candy. Some pans may have hot spots in them. And so you're not getting an even amount of temperature from your pan. Try to use something with a heavy bottom on it so you can prevent a lot of hot spots. Humidity, again, in your kitchen. The candy can attract moisture, and that can cause a separation. Can you save it? Maybe. (laughs) It really kind of depends. You can try gradually heating the mixture up 
and stirring it, and hopefully it'll go back together. Another trick is you could try adding like a tablespoon or two of hot water. Hopefully that'll kind of dissolve that sugar enough that it'll pull that butter back in. But if it's separated after you've poured it out on the pan, you've got to that point, there's really nothing you can do. It's still edible. Just crunch it up and use it as an ice cream topping instead. (laughs) Now, what gives it the flavor? What gives it the toffee flavor? That's part of the cooking process. It's caramelizing the butter and the sugar together. There's a couple reactions. You know, the higher the temperature that you go at temperatures above 330 degrees, you get into the caramelization phase. That's where the caramely flavor comes from. There's another browning reaction called a Maillard reaction, and that is a reaction between the sugars and the proteins that are in the butter. So you get that browning reaction. You said that you will oftentimes add chocolate to this, either dunk it in chocolate or just put it over the top. What kind of chocolate should we be using? Try to use really good chocolate if you can. Chocolate chips usually have some added ingredients in them. They're not just pure chocolate. You know, if you really want the good quality candy in the end, I would go for the pure type chocolate, the bar type chocolate, the baking chocolate, things like that. You don't want to use unsweetened chocolate for that kind of a thing, for a topping on a toffee. You want something that's a semi-sweet. Let's also talk a little bit about peanut butter balls because you've been getting some questions about those also in regard to the chocolate. That's right. Peanut butter balls are what's also known as buckeyes. You form little balls of peanut butter and then they're coated with a chocolate coating. A lot of old time recipes call for using wax in the chocolate to help it solidify around the ball and to give it that shiny appearance. Personally, I would not want to really eat any wax. (laughs) So an alternative to using wax is to use vegetable shortening. And you would want to use two tablespoons plus two teaspoons per 12 ounces of semi-sweet chocolate. And that will help solidify the chocolate around the balls and it'll help give it that shiny appearance. The other thing you could do, and you would not have to add any shortening or any wax to it at all, is tempering the chocolate. And that's getting the temperature between 84 and 88 degrees. It's warm enough that you can dip and you'll end up still to get a solid appearance and a shiny appearance in the end by tempering the chocolate. And again, use really good chocolate for that. Now, is that done directly over the stove or do we go to the double boiler? I would use a double boiler because you can get a little better heat control. And then you can, if you have to take it on and off the water, you can do that too. So that would be the best way to do that. I guess the other probably favorite this time of year would be the candy cane. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking the only thing maybe complicated about that is making the stripes. Getting the stripes on there, it's it's a real art in doing that because you got to get the big mass of candy to start with, get it all lined up just right so that the stripes are uniform all the way throughout. And candy canes have been around for many, many years. They date clear back to 1670 in Germany. And I found some information from the National Confectioners Association that said that legend has it back in 1670 that the choir master at a cathedral in Germany handed out sugar sticks to his young singers to keep them quiet during the church ceremony. And in honor of the occasion, he had the candies bent to look like shepherd's crooks. So that's how candy canes supposedly started. It so always it, starts with trying to keep kids quiet, I, it? It does. <laughs> it all goes back to the kids this time of year. So, Well, a lot of fun things to try. If you like the smoothie creamy, you can go for the fudge. If you like stuff a little bit more broken up, you can go for the brittles. Mm-hmm. Lots of things this time of year. And I, I guess what you're saying is not a lot of food safety issues, but temperature, humidity, the actual cooking environment, probably more critical for candy. Exactly. I think your best friend in making candy is a candy thermometer. If you don't have one and you want to make candy, I really recommend you get one. That's K-State Research and Extension Food Scientist and Coordinator of K-State's Rapid Response Center, Karen Blakesley. More information on food safety, preparation, and preservation is available at county and district extension offices and on the extension website, www.ksre.ksu.edu. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman, and this is the K-State Radio Network.